Here we're gonna look at an interesting counting geometry problem that will lead us to a proof of Fermat's little theorem. So let's look at the setup. Suppose we've got a circle and we've divided that circle into P different but equal sectors. So a sector of a circle is like a pizza slice. And here we have P is prime. So I've drawn it this way. Here is sector one, which is shaded green. Here is sector two, which is like this peach color. Sector three is red, sector four is purple. And then obviously since P is a prime number, we have to like just put some dots to say that we're going around the circle. And then sector P minus one and sector P. And so our warm up question, which I'm calling question one, is how many different ways can we color this circle if we co color all of the sectors and we have n total colors? So let's see maybe how to do this. So let's think about sector one. Well, there are n choices for sector one. Okay, now let's look at sector two. Well, there are still n choices for sector two. Notice I haven't put any rules on the adjacent sectors can or cannot have the same coloring. Then sector three, there are still n choices. All the way up sector P, there are n choices. So that means there are a total of n times itself, P times, or n to the P total colorings. So that would be our answer to this kind of first warm up question. So the second question that I want to look at, add some sort of equivalence into two colorings. So let's maybe phrase it like this. What if two colorings are equivalent? So I'll put that in quotes. If they are rotations of each other. Okay, as an example, this picture right here would be equivalent to the coloring that we would get if we ticked this counterclockwise by one over P of the way around the circle. So that would make S2 green. S3, this peach color, S4, this red color, S5 would be purple, and then SP would be blue, and S1 would be yellow because of how we moved it around. So that would be an equivalent coloring, and thus it would not be counted differently. Okay, so let's maybe break this into two parts. So let's say N is this number of colorings, and I'm gonna break it into two types. So the first type is every sector has the same color. So notice that's kind of a boring coloring, but that's definitely one allowed coloring. So every sector could be green, every sector could be red, every sector could be purple, and so on and so forth. Plus, my second case will be at least two sectors are different colors. So now we'd like to count up these two types. So this type where we have every sector having the same color, well, that's actually not so hard to see. There are n total choices for that. And that's just everything colored green, everything blue, everything orange, but for n total colors. So here we have n for this. Now to this, we need to add the number of colorings that we get where two sectors are different colors. And I should say at least two sectors are different colors. So we can start off with the rest of the colorings that we've described over here in question one. And that's pretty easy to write down. That's just n to the p minus n. So at the moment, we've counted all of the colorings as being inequivalent, even if one can be rotated into the other. Now we need to look at these two types of colorings and then divide by a number that ensures that we are not double counting equivalent colorings. So let's see, if we've colored every sector the same, then any sort of rotation is just gonna give us exactly the same coloring. So in other words, if we've colored everything all blue, well, there's only one way to do that. If we've colored everything all green, well, there's also only one way to do that, and so on and so forth. So here we can just divide this by one. In a sense, there's just one element from each of these equivalence classes. So next, we need to figure out what to divide this second quantity by. And a priori, we don't know that we can divide all of these things in the other class by the same number, but we will prove that we can. And so what we'll wanna divide this by is the number 
of colorings equivalent to each other. So if we can figure out this number and really argue that this number is the same for every type of coloring in this class, then we're done. So let's clean this up so we have enough room to do that. On the last board, we argued that our goal number, which is the number of different colorings of a circle broken into P sectors within different colors, where we consider two different colorings equivalent if they are rotations of each other, we express that as n plus n to the p minus n over this number which is yet to be calculated, and that is the number of colorings equivalent to each other. And here we have the claim which will finish this off, and that is each coloring with at least two different colors is equivalent to exactly P other colorings. So let's maybe see how to do this. So let's say we've got some coloring of the circle and we call that coloring C0. Then we can rotate it one over P around the circle and that will give us coloring C1. We can rotate it another, that'll give us C2. And then we can rotate it all the way up to here, that'll give us CP minus one. So here we've got P colorings. And what we need to show is two things. So the first thing that we need to show is that no other coloring is equivalent to C0 or C1 or C2 up to Cp minus one. In other words, this is a complete list of colorings that's equivalent to C0. Okay, and then the second thing we need to show is that none of these colorings are equal. So we'll write that like this, none are equal. And I don't mean equivalent because they are all equivalent under this rotation, but I mean they are not equal. That is, they must require some rotation to turn one into the other. Okay, so let's see maybe how we could do this first part. Okay, so for the proof of this first part, we'll start with something equivalent to C0. So let's suppose that C is equivalent to C0. So I'll just write it like that. So that means it's a rotation of C0. So let's write that down. So we've got C is a, a rotation by M, and I'll just write it like this, clicks around the circle. So what I mean by a click is just like one kind of smallest unit of rotation. So that's one over P times around the circle. Now we're gonna use the division algorithm to write M as K times P plus R, where K is a natural number and R is between zero and P minus one. So that's just division with remainder. You know, the fancy word for that is using the division algorithm. But with this setup, we clearly see that our coloring, which is equivalent to C0, is actually equal to C sub R. Because rotating around P clicks is like not rotating at all. So we're just left with this remainder right here. And so this is equality of colorings, not equivalence of colorings. So what that tells us is that if we have a coloring equivalent to C0, then it's on this list. And where is it on that list? Well, it's whatever this remainder is by dividing the number of clicks by P. Okay, so let's maybe look at this second part. So now we need to look at the second part, and that is showing that none of these are equal to each other. So we're gonna proceed by way of contradiction. And without loss of generality, we might as well assume that C0 is equal to some other person on this list. So let's maybe go ahead and assume that. So let's suppose that we have K from the set one up to P minus one, such that C0 is equal to CK. So that means when you rotate C0 onto CK, you get exactly the same thing. So now let's take a sector from C0 or CK because they're the same thing. So let's say S0 is one of the sectors. So maybe that's the zeroth sector. And let's suppose that that is a certain color. So we might as well assume that it's orange. Now, since C0 is equal to CK, well, we can make this K rotation 
and end up with the same sectors on the same spots. So in other words, we also know that CK is orange. But now applying the rotation again, we'll see that CS2K is also orange and then so on and so forth. So in other words, any multiple of K will give us an orange sector. So let's write that down, SMK is orange, and that's gonna be true for all integers M. Now since P is prime, and then K is on the set one to P minus one, that means K and P are relatively prime. But then by Bezu's identity, that means we can form the following equation. And that is k times y equals 1 plus p times x. In other words, there are natural numbers x and y that allow us to complete that. Okay, so that's good. So next what we'll do is take this equation and multiply it by L where L is any number between one and P minus one. So I'll multiply the left-hand side by L and I'll also multiply the right-hand side by L. But next, we'll look at the sectors of the circle built out of this equation. So that tells us that the S, L, K, Y circle, sector of the circle is the same as the L circle of, sector of the circle. But earlier we showed that any sector of the circle that was a multiple of k was orange. But here we've expressed every sector of the circle as a multiple of k, but that tells us that every sector of the circle is orange. But that's a contradiction because the setting we're in right now is that we have two sectors with different circles. Okay, so in other words, we've proven this claim that each coloring with at least two different colors is equivalent to exactly P other colorings. So that means we can take this number right here and replace it with P. Now we're ready to apply our result to prove Fermat's little theorem. And this is a version of Fermat's little theorem. There's also another popular version. I'll let you guys look that up if you don't know it. So if P is prime and N is a natural number, then N to the P is congruent to N mod P. Well, let's see. In question two, we counted up the number of colorings of this circle where we used N colors under this equivalence condition. And we found out that that number, which we called N, was equal to N plus N to the P minus N over P. But notice that this n is most definitely a counting number, in other words, a natural number. So now we can rearrange this pretty easily to see that n to the p minus n is equal to p times capital N minus little n. But now reducing mod p, we see that that is congruent to zero mod p because it's a multiple of p. But saying that n to the p minus n is congruent to zero mod p is equivalent to saying n to the p is congruent to n mod p. And that's a good place to stop.